Welcome, everybody, to the Applos webinar. Um, we're going to talk about uh, board recruitment, retention, motivation. Uh, I'm Dan Kimball. This is your first time on an Applos webinar. We want to welcome you. Uh, so glad you take time out of your busy schedule to join us. Um, and a um, little bit about who I am. Uh, I have the privilege once a month to, uh, to do a webinar uh, about fundraising, which is my passion. Um, my background's in fundraising, and I love to um, talk about my experiences and, and gather other people's experiences. And, and um, hopefully it'll help you as a, as a nonprofit leader and a nonprofit worker help you do your jobs better. And I know that we all, um, if you work in a nonprofit, you know that it's kind of a struggle. And so part of the purpose of the webinar is to encourage you um, and to maybe give you some resources. So with that, we're going to uh, get going here. And so just a quick uh, way of introduction uh, about today is that we're going to be talking about boards and really going to be talking about uh, how do we find boards? How do we motivate our boards? How do we keep our boards engaged? Um, one of the things we're not going to do is we're not going to spend too much time on board fundraising. I actually have a webinar on how to get your board to fundraise. That's uh, You can find that in our Aplos Academy. But really what we're going to be working on is how do we manage a board um, and how do we help your board kind of accomplish your goals? Um, are there talent gaps you need to fill? Um, we're going to hopefully tell you a little bit about how to find and recruit new board members as well as keeping the existing ones um, uh, motivated. So a few things we're going to go over is how do, we, how do we identify and strategically fill some of the gaps. Uh, we're going to talk about talent. Uh, we're going to define clear expectations uh, and how do we improve accountability, a little bit about that, and um, help board members embrace fundraising. That, though that's there, that should always be there. It's really not going to be the focus of this webinar. So um, and then, as usual, at the very end, the volume is a little on the – okay, sorry. May, you might try to turn up your own volume, um, but thank you for that uh, comment. But what we're going to do on the uh, questions, well, we always leave a little time at the end for question and answer and, and help you do that. So first of all, by kind of way of introduction and get things going, let's talk about what the role of the board is. And I think um, I'm assuming everybody that's, that's on either – is on a board or is leading a board of some kind. Of course, if you're a 501c3, if you're a nonprofit um, and, and even a church in that case, you, you, you probably you, you should have a board. You need to have a board. Um, sometimes there's a little confusion about what the purpose of the board is. Um, but just by way of a kind of reminder is, is a few points about what our board does. And also, by the way, before I get into that, just want to kind of remind folks that we, uh, we use Twitter a lot. Um, at Aplos. So if you are a Twitter person, you want to engage in us, you can use the hashtag Aplos webinar. Um, and then my Twitter handle is at Fugitive DMK. You're welcome to ask me questions. Uh, we have um, one of our Aplos staff that's on Twitter right now, kind of monitoring the chat. So if you have questions, you can uh, you can chat those uh, through Twitter as well. So with that, um, so let's talk a little bit about the role of the board. So the first, of course, is the board's role is to determine the mission and purpose. It's really the board's responsibility to um, to help create the, the the mission statement in the beginning, but then also um, to to help um, uh, make sure that that mission is followed through. Um, another role of the board is to select the, the chief executive that some people will call an executive director or president. Um, but it really has to be the board who who reaches a consensus on on those responsibilities. And um, of course, if there's a vacancy, it's the board's role to do a careful search and find the most qualified person. Um, and then also with that, it's to support and evaluate the, the chief person, the leader, the executive director. The board should ensure that chief executor has a has a um, you know has professional support he needs or she needs uh, to further the goals. Um, and I love that word support because a lot of times um, a lot of boards kind of have this um, you know relationship with uh, their CEOs that's like, well, we're your boss. And, and then that's true. There really should be some support, two-way support going on you know, and checking in and making sure that they have everything they need. Of course, they, the board needs to ensure effective planning. Uh, boards must actively participate in an overall planning process. Uh, and this is something that we're going to get into uh, down the road a little bit is, is you're going to ask some questions about um, you know, uh, how, how active is your board in these kinds of things? Are you bringing a plan to your board? Or are they just rubber stamping it? Or are they offering feedback, two-way communication? Um, but the board's there to ensure effective planning. And then, of course, they're there to monitor and strength, strengthen program and services. And really what that is, that's not 
micromanage with that is that's their responsibility to make sure that the programs are consistent with the organization's mission. So for example, if you're a youth-based organization and say your 501c3 is set up to um, do after-school tutoring only, that's your one and only thing. And all of a sudden, the the um, the program has decided, well, we want to do maybe a, a food giveaway for adults or something like that. And maybe somebody on the board might say, well, wait a minute, let's stop and think about that. This really isn't part of our mission. So it's, it's an accountability that happens with the board. And of course, the financial side, the board's role is to, add, is to make sure that the finances are adequate. Um, and then there are also the oversight. They're the legal and fiduciary overs oversight of that 51C3. That falls on the board. That's a lot of things in my years of fundraising. That's one of the things that sometimes when things maybe aren't going well in a nonprofit, people will say, well, that was the responsibility of the executive director especially when there's financial concerns, when really it's the board has to be a part of that. So they need to protect the assets and they need to provide the proper financial oversight. That means things like making sure there's an audit, um, making sure that the financial statements are correct and accurate and, um, and, and healthy uh, in the finances. And then also with that is to build a competent board. It's actually ironic, but it's really the board's responsibility to make sure that the board kind of re, uh, re-picks itself and, and continually to put other people on that board. It's a, it's a relationship between the board and the, um, uh, the, the board and the, um, the, the executive director as well. And then of course we talked a little bit about ensure legal and ethical integrity. Um, it's really the board is ultimately responsible for making sure all the legal standards and, and things are being run, um, um, with, with strong ethics and all of that. And really the first place you start with that is your bylaws, just making sure your bylaws are, are being, um, followed correctly and, and all of that. And then, and then last, and, and I don't know if it's, it's in order of importance, but the board should clearly articulate the mission, but it's also to make sure that the public, um, you know, has trust and that, that the reputation of that nonprofit is, um, stands true to what its mission um, is and, and that it has a good reputation. So with that, kind of keep that in mind as we, as we get into a little bit now, now that you have this board and they're following these things, what do we do with it? So before uh, we will give some kind of some tips and suggestions, I want to do a little quiz. Um, I've never done a quiz on the webinar before, but just for the thought, I want you to, um, you can do this in your head or if you have a, um, a pencil in front of you, you can just kind of mark a yes or no. We're going to go through a series of questions. And just by way of reference, this came to me from uh, an organization called Board Source. If you Google Board Source, you'll get on that. And I, I will mention them at the end. Board Source is a great tool for, um, especially there's a lot of tools about how to work with boards um, and just tons of ideas and resources for working with boards, especially if you're a small nonprofit that uh, maybe doesn't have um, a lot of subscriptions or, or access to, to some help. So real quick, let's just go through these questions. I'm just going to read them off here, but you can, of course, see them on your screen. Um, and hopefully, um, and just mark yes or no. Does the same small group of trustees tend to do most of the work on the board? Have any trustees missed half or more of your board meetings in the past year? Has your board failed to reach a quorum at any board meeting in the last 12 months? And again, we're just doing kind of a quick yes or no. Does your board struggle to recruit and retain talented, skilled, and diverse trustees? And we're going to talk about that a little bit too. Do board members make commitments but often fail to fulfill those promises? Hopefully you're not uh, groaning and moaning as we go through this. Do board meetings last longer than planned? We're going to talk about that. Yes or no? Does your board auto automatically renew a member's term if that trustee is willing, uh, if that person's willing to, to go again? In other words, are they, um, you know, are, 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 is your board hoping for people to get off quickly? Does your board have no maximum number of years that a trustee can serve? Term limits. Does your organization either move from crisis to crisis or keep addressing the same issue over and over? Number 10. Are the board committees functioning less than optimally? That's a, that means if you have a board that has like a fundraising committee and a finance committee and a program committee and those kinds of things. Great. 
I see some no's. I see some yeses. Brittany's answering there. Okay, just a few more. Does your board struggle to find good leaders who are willing and qualified to be chair? In other words, are they are they not wanting to take other responsibilities? Do board members complain that they're asked to do things uh, that they never expected to do, like that they were surprised? Yes or no? Does the agenda for the board meetings look the same meeting after meeting? Is it a kind of a blank template that looks just like it's just copied and paste? Has it been longer than two years since the board formally addressed itself? with a written tool and a frank discussion about the results. And then finally, does your board suffer from boring meetings, board meetings, boring meetings? So really what board source says is that if you, if you take all your yeses and nos and add them up, of course the, the, you know, the fewer yeses um, uh, mean that, you know, if you have three or four yeses and all the rest nos, pretty much means that your board's engaged and they're active and things are going well. Um, but if you have a lot of yeses, it might mean that as a, as a nonprofit leader, as an executive director, as, a, as a, somebody that's working with a board, you might want to uh, kind of go through and look at some of these things and, and, and figure out why. So, um, so for the first part of this segment, we're going to just talk a little bit about board burnout um, because because I think that really is the battle when we talk about keeping your board engaged. Um, just like you want to keep your donors engaged in your organization, if you've been on any of my webinars in the past, we talk a lot about donor engagement and, and, and being active with your donors. It's the same is true with your board. You don't want to take advantage um, of the work they're doing. And so, so just kind of as a point of that, it's, a, it's always a good idea to assess your board's engagement and performance at least once a year. Um, I really believe in board retreats, annual board retreats. Um, you don't necessarily have to ha spend a lot of money to do a good board retreat. Um, um, your organization will benefit from being sensitive to the possibility of, of trustee burnout and taking steps to, to address those. And there's ways you can do that through surveys. Um, if you do a board retreat, just spending some time doing self-assessment. The same way you do a self-assessment of your own organization, you can do it with your board. Um, and there's tons of tools out there, and we'll we'll leave you at the end with with a, a few of those where you can get more information. Or even if you're in a place, you can bring in a, um, most communities. It's easy to find someone that does um, some some board consulting. That somebody will come in, uh, and 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 help you with your retreats and and all of that. Another great idea that I love is to do a board matrix. Basically, what that means is list. List the skills, the demographics, and the tenure of your board. You can kind of do this on a spreadsheet or on a piece of paper and, and decide whether your board um, you have is the board that your organization needs. In other words, are these just – did you just fill 12 seats because your bylaw said so or are you finding people um, – um, that that fit the, the various needs of that organization. Um, and if you don't have an active governance committee, um, maybe it's time to form one. And we'll talk about governance, but what governance is, is one or two people on that board or a committee of people that are really looking at things like term limits and responsibilities. And even in some board's cases, they actually have job descriptions uh, for the board members. Um, and you don't have to be a large organization to have something like that. So these are ways to kind of address and deal with board burnout a little bit. So just a few quick things about how to avoid burnout. Um, you know, first, I think the most important is the boards that don't follow effective meeting practices uh, and fail to make good use of board members' time and skills really risk losing uh, engagement. Um, you got to remember that in a lot of cases, board members are very busy. A lot of board meetings happen in the evenings after a long work day. And for me, as a as a, as a, both a nonprofit leader and someone that's that's um, you know that's currently sits on boards, um, you know, there's nothing more frustrating than than being ready to go at a six o'clock board meeting and people are you know talking and socializing. People are late, and all of a sudden it's six thirty or six forty five before we start. But, for me as a board member, that's very frustrating. Uh, maybe some of you are, are in a little bit more of a casual board environment, uh, but just you really want to make sure that your board meetings include um, time for discussing strategic issues beyond, beyond the routine, you know, uh, approving of the minutes and the bio, you know, and those kinds of things. So um, I think just as a good practice, it's important that the executive director and the board chair are working really hard and closely together to making sure that the meetings are 
not only you know timely and effective, but um, there's there's quality in there as well. Um, and board members just might be exhausted. Um, now might be the time to take a hard look at some of your board members' tenures. Um, you know, are there trustees who should be uh, rotated off the board? Um, would the board benefit from an infusion of new ideas and new energy um, that they can bring? I think sometimes when executive directors are are a little frustrated and they think, oh, my board, they just they're just not quite getting it done. That's that's uh, just looking at the tenure and the types of people. And it and it's not necessarily has to be a bad thing, uh, you know, to to um, to in a sense encourage someone to maybe take a break. Um, I'm currently on a board right now um, here in the community where Applos is. And one of the things we're doing is we're taking some board members and we're moving them over to an advisory committee. Uh, so instead of being on the board of trustees, they're serving in a different capacity. And we're giving them some new roles and it's kind of um, kind of inviting, first of all, new people to come on the board, but giving those people to stay involved, but also changing their time commitments a little bit. So we find that to be effective. So those are a couple um, things on board burnout. So so really, before we get into how do you uh, get the most out of your board, you just really, really want to address that first. Take an evaluation. Is your board burned out? Um, and also be really honest. Um, you know, take a survey of your board and, and talk to them. Just like you do with donors, as an executor, as an executive or a leader of an organization, get to know your board members and, and get a feel, um, you know, for them and, and if they are enjoying um, what they like and, and what they'd like to see more in the board. So let's talk about talent. You know, one of the things about boards is that, you know, we get people, but are we are we really addressing the talent issues? I don't know if you've ever heard the term about time, talent and treasure. Um, those are kind of the three qualities you're looking for from uh, board members, people that can give their time, uh, talent, and then, of course, their treasure, meaning people that will give. Hopefully, most of your board members are, are giving. We hope so. That's something I addressed in my last webinar on board giving. You can find that on our Aplos Academy. Um, you can also use the hashtag, uh, hashtag Aplos webinar uh, if you have ideas on that or you have questions about that. Um, but board member talent is something that we, we focus on time, meaning they give a lot of their volunteer time and they donate, but are we really tapping into their talent? And, and, and what does that mean? And that means, you know, first of all, let's think strategically, what skills and talent does your, does your nonprofit need to move forward its mission and advance their work, um, over the next coming year? So that's the first thing you want to ask is what do we need? What kinds of board members do we need? Um, are these people, um, you know, we all come from a variety of different nonprofits, but um, you don't necessarily have to do the traditional, well, I need a lawyer, an accountant, and a, you know, um, and a marketing person on my board. But maybe you you have people that um, have a whole different skill set that you haven't thought about before. Which of those talents uh, are currently representing on your board and which of those are missing? That's a really great way just to do a quick assessment of talent. Um, what's going well? What What roles are people filling? Um, if you're an event heavy organization, meaning that you do a lot of special events, maybe you have um, you have folks that give a lot of their time and uh, but maybe you need people that can help um, uh, um, take on more of that. So your staff's not as burnt out. Events can be um, very time consuming and can burn out your staff. And so maybe your board can help alleviate some of that. Maybe you're having uh, HR um, you, uh, needs and, and there's someone in the board that can help with the resources there. Um, well, another great way to kind of look at talent is, is, is really write down how would you describe the skills and expertise and attributes of the ideal candidate, meaning, um, kind of, kind of, uh, list who's the perfect board member for you. And beyond just the, well, I'd love someone to walk in and give me, you know, a million dollars, uh, kind of thing. So that would be a good way to, to, to begin to look at your, your talent. Um, I love this. I saw this somewhere when I was um, uh, reading about board work, and I and I forget who said this, but they said, "Is your board a bench warmer or a game changer?" Um, and I, I thought that was a really a great thing. Are they sitting on the sidelines? And so one of your roles as a nonprofit leader, and as a, and as, a, as an executive and a leader of your nonprofit, is you matching your board members not only with skills but capacity, meaning that. You have some people that can give a lot of time, but maybe not a lot of money. And that's okay. You have some people that maybe write big checks, but they don't have as much time 
and that's okay too. And so it, it's kind of figuring out. And, and so maybe, um, and we find this a lot, especially with young board members, is that um, we have a lot of organizations that maybe have been around for a while and they tend to kind of go after sort of the, the known uh, people in their town or community, people who have been around for a long time, people who have served on a ton of boards, and they forget that there's maybe young people um, uh, that can uh, that can provide a certain talent um, uh, and and have the capacity. And capacity means, you know, what are some of those other things that they can bring to the table? Um, so you want to be thinking about that. Um, I like to kind of talk about this a little bit. Um, still no audio hearing you. Are, it, can a couple of you just uh, uh, tap in and tell me that you're hearing this okay? Because we have some people who are saying they don't hear the audio. Okay, fine. So I think, Heidi, the audio is out. Great. Thank you. Sorry about that. Heidi, I think the audio is on your end. Uh, thank you, Brittany and Chelsea. Thank you, guys. So, um, again, don't always define talent by a board member's day job. Um, I like to, you know, the best example is that a lot of boards, what they'll do is they'll they'll look for accountants and they'll put automatically put them on the finance committee. And believe it or not, some um, a lot of people that I know that do the same thing all day don't want to do that on the board. Some do, and that's okay. But it's really not um, – I think you'll, you'll get a mixed feel, uh, opinion about this. But the more I talk to, to nonprofit leaders, the more I, I'm agreeing that you don't necessarily have to have an accountant and a lawyer to take care of your legal and financial on your board. Um, a lot of board members, you can outsource that. A lot of board members know people who will donate some of that. Um, and so um, to kind of be sensitive to that and you want to in the in the um, in the process of bringing board members on get a feel for for what they're looking for. Some people just are have fallen in love with your mission and they just want to come in and, and, you know, maybe stuff envelopes or something like that. So it's really important that you don't just select by um, by what they do, but what the um, what it is they love about your organization and what's bringing them to want to give more. And that's kind of really just thinking outside the box a little bit um, in terms of, uh, of, of some non-traditional types of things. Um, you know, take a look at your bylaws. If it says, you know, you'd have to have 15 board members, you know, think about are there people um, that have gone through your organization have been um, in, that can give back in a, in a different kind of way. So, um, you know, um, another way to look at it is um, uh, is talk to them. Uh, use the board meetings to talk and communicate about what some of the needs are. Um, like I said earlier, not everyone necessarily wants to be on the gala or fundraising committee, and that's okay. Um, do you have sectors of the community that you're trying to ac gain access to? For example, um, let's say you're you're trying to um, do a little bit more with your local community college or university, or you're trying to get a group of high schoolers to get involved. Um, maybe your board can help you with that. Talk to your staff and find out what, what your staff needs are and take those to the board because the board's role is to support you as an executive director to make your job easier and to make your organization successful. Um, and so it's a great way to connect with volunteers um, is to use your board um, as a sound as a sounding board with without the pun. I apologize, but um, it's kind of a, it's a great way to open doors and provide introductions is through your board. Um, so that's just kind of a, a way to kind of leverage your your board, your your talent on your board. And at the end, we'd love to hear um, questions about that. Um, and any of any of your own stories, you can also use um, hashtag Applos Webinar um, if you have any any good stories out there. So so now I'm sure a lot of people are going to ask about recruitment. So the question is, how do I get board members? I'm hoping that that's not a a huge struggle, but but I but it probably is because um, believe it or not, I don't think people. For the most part, I don't think people go looking to be on boards, though there are websites out there and there's organizations that will match people with nonprofits to help them uh, to put them on boards. For the most part, people don't usually call you up and say, hey, I really want to give 50 hours of my free time and make a donation and be on your board. That not usually what happens. It's usually through more recruitment and a little more concentrated effort. Um, so let's talk about some of the some of the ways we can go about um, board recruitment. And this isn't uh, only the how to, but this is also kind of, you know, what you want to be looking for. One of the things I'm finding is that if you fill, um, are you filling for need or are you just trying to fill seats? In other words, your board is set up to be 13 people, 12 people, whatever. 
and you know two people are going off are like, well, let's just get two people. Well, no, maybe you want to ask, okay, you know, what do we need? So that's the, before you even start recruiting, you really want to ask that question and who you need, what you have and what you want. It's a really great exercise and it's an easy thing to write down and say, who do we currently have? Who do we need? And what is it that, that we want? That's a good way to kind of start as in your in your recruitment um, process. Um, you know, uh, this is this is becoming more and more common. Um, does your board reflect the population and community that you serve? Um, you know, and, they, and this this is, is necessarily isn't just about, say, color, um, though that is a, a real common thing is, is we see people that they might be serving um, a specific group of people. Uh, group of uh, you know ethnicity wise and um, and you know board members don't even represent who they serve and but believe it or not there's a lot of foundations and a lot of funders out there a lot of people like United Ways who are really looking at that more closely because they want to see boards who are diverse they want to see um, boards that represent um, who it is that they serve and I think that's really important and I also think your message becomes a little stronger uh, when you have that so it's something you really want to. Um, you want to think about um, um, not just, um, you know, as you go forward. Another thing is establishing a criteria for selecting board members uh, so that you've found uh, the right people. And so you can do things like um, having um, maybe board, I, I use the word job descriptions, but they don't have to be all that formal. But, um, you know, what types of people, what are the criteria? Um, do they, you know, uh, do they need to, you um, uh, do they need to be an alumni of your organization? It doesn't have to be the case, but I'm just saying just kind of writing out uh, some, of the, some of the things that you're looking for, and it makes the recruitment process um, a little bit, um, I think, easier. Um, I think this is really important is having a nominating committee or a process in place, meaning uh, a, a couple people on the board who can work with the executive director that – that can formally nominate uh, boards because, as you probably know, that um, you know everyone does it a little bit differently. But typically, what what tends to happen is is there should be a time during one of your board meetings or several of your board meetings during the year where you talk about, all right, are there folks that we're interested in in having uh, um, having come on the board? Well, a nominating committee can do a couple things. One, they can vet out those people, meaning they can do some of the research, some of the asking, some of the talking to those people beforehand. They can also bring ideas to the board uh, so that you don't get to a board meeting and all of a sudden there's a one-hour discussion about a bunch of people that nobody's ever met before. So a nominating committee can kind of help um, speed up the process, but also do some of the legwork on behalf of the rest of the board. So I really am a believer in that. Um, some bylaws um, actually state a nominating committee. Uh, a lot don't, which is fine. And um, But I think it's a, a good way to, to get your board members engaged in, in the um, recruitment process. Um, look for qualities that will help the board uh, function better and do its job better. Again, we're talking about fill for need, not for seats. Um, you know, depending on what nonprofit you, what the, your mission is, and it really all comes down to the mission. And if, if you're ever at a point where you're, you know, a little confused by that, by that comment, uh, look, go back and look at what it is you do. Uh, what, what's the impact you're trying to make? What's the mission? What are you trying to accomplish? And who can you bring on your board to help you do that? Uh, whether that's, I mean, you know, beyond the fundraising, typically, you know, fundraising is a big challenge, uh, but but you want to not only get people who can do the fundraising, but who can help, again, support your staff um, and the work that you do, regardless of the size of your nonprofit. I think this this can um, uh, be real, real helpful to you. Again, uh, we used a hashtag Applis webinar if you're uh, interested in uh, interacting with us on Twitter. And of course, um, my email will be up and available. We, we take questions. Uh, in between uh, um, our webinars. And of course, uh, a recording of this will be made available um, on our Aplos uh, Academy um, as well. So you can get a recording of this if, if that's interesting to you. So some things when looking for potential board members, here's some of the kinds of people I think uh, you want to be looking for uh, in your recruitment process. First of all, I think you want to really find people who have an understanding of your community. I use the word our community and its needs. Um, 
and 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 I think that becomes really really important. People that really understand um, the the area in which you serve. If you're a um, organization that um, is say local and you serve something far away, like maybe overseas. I serve on a board here in Fresno where we do some work in the Congo. Uh, you know, um, you, you want to have some kind of representation of of of, of that um, on your board. Um, you want to have obviously someone who's passionate for your cause. Um, you want to have someone who's willing to, who willing to commit uh, for the board meetings, committee meetings, session meetings, uh, planning sessions, uh, and special events. Um, time is, and, and that's something that we'll we'll talk about a little bit in a further. But um, it's really important that you communicate that. What are the expectations? Um, obviously, you want team players. You want people who work well in a group. And these are just ideas when you're. Uh, when we talked about, um, you know, kind of making a list of some of the um, um, qualities, these are things that, that I suggest really work well. Uh, obviously, someone who listens well um, and is thoughtful and, and considering issues. Um, it, so I've, I've heard some stories about boards that, you know, argue a lot and, and you're, you get people that just kind of want to kind of throw their opinion about everything. And and that's okay. I mean, that's part of the process a little bit, but I think that they're, that in, in selecting your board and recruiting your board, you really want to find that right team. It's kind of like, you know, if you're putting together sort of an all-star team, you know, you want to put an all-star board together and use an executive director and, and with the help of your board chair and board members can do that. If you have a good relationship with your nominating committee and you're expressing to them the kinds of people uh, that you have, then um, I think you can, in, in moving forward, recruit really strong people. So when recruiting, because I get this question a lot from nonprofits, the ones that I have the opportunity to work with is, is okay, so where do I look? Uh, uh, where do I start if you're a new or a young nonprofit? Um, a lot of times what happens is in starting a nonprofit, uh, once you do all the paperwork, the 501c3, you get sort of an initial board. Many times what happens is is you get you get some turnover early on. And a lot of that's because uh, people maybe realize they said yes because they were excited about you starting the 501c3. But then all of a sudden they realize, you know, this is a little more time than, than I have or you know, life cycles. I mean, uh, people have situations that, that come up where they feel badly because they can't give as much time, whether it's a family sickness or work or whatever. Um, and that's okay. But so, so um, you know, so as, as people cycle out, you want to be thinking about how do we bring new people in. So first and foremost, start with your dedicated and active volunteers. Who are people that that you see who are are really committed to you and ask, will that be a good board member? Sometimes they're not always going to be, but it's a great place to start. So look at the people who are donating. Look at the people who are giving hours. If you're an organization like a Ronald McDonald House where there's um, lots of volunteer opportunities, look at some of those people who really stand out that, that have that time. Um, I think considering your donors is a great idea. If someone's given a lot of money to your organization, that typically tells me um, that they care, that they're passionate, um, and they could make a good uh, board member. And, of course, it's also great for fundraising. It's really okay to strategically place someone on your board with the idea that they'll be not only a good donor themselves, but they might encourage the donor, the other board members to give also. So that's an okay thing to do. Sometimes people feel like, oh, I'm, you know, I mean, you don't want to ever make someone feel like they're just being asked because of their donation, but it's certainly okay to, to have that as one of the qualities as you look for board members. Ask your current board member and staff for nominations and recommendations. If you're the one that's always doing the thinking about that, then I would encourage you to change your thinking a little bit and really from time to time, put it out there to your board and say, hey, who who do you all think would be good? There's there's a couple reasons why I think this is important, is that if your board is is really hand selected by you, um, there can be there can be some um, potential problems. One is that um, it could look like you're stacking the board, you're just putting your own friends on and you know best friends on there, and that can be hard because if the hard decisions uh, has to be made. Um, it can be a little awkward, um, but I think it's really important. But then also what it does is it gives the board ownership um, of, of its own decisions. And so I think it's really important that you get your board involved in that. And then reach out beyond those, uh, beyond your nonprofit. 
Um, you know, I, I love having younger people on the board. I like having youth representatives on boards. Um, I think people, uh, you know, obviously in business or from other organizations is a really good thing. Uh, people that if you're a nonprofit, um, it's OK to ask other nonprofit leaders to serve on your board. Many times people, when they're trying to learn about your organizations, one of the first things they do is they look at the board. Um, sometimes people even put their board members on their their letterhead or their stationery, if people even use that anymore. Um, and um, and it's important because then people, you know, will say, hey, I recognize that person. He's a he or she. They're really a they're a great leader. They run the rescue mission or they run the food bank or or whatever. Or that's the superintendent from the school. I really like that person. And so they will warm people to your organization through the board members, believe it or not. Though hopefully it's your mission that attracts people, your board will will um, draw people uh, to the organization um, if they're well known or liked in your community where you serve. So I think that's a really great way. Um, communicate the fact that you're recording board members through multiple channels, like your newsletter, word of mouth. Use Facebook. I mean, that's an okay thing to say. Hey, folks, um, I see this a lot. I follow a lot of nonprofits on Facebook and Twitter. Um, and well, I see call outs. I say, hey, we're looking for some board members. Uh, if you know anybody or, or you have any ideas, give us a give us a, a, a call or, a, you know, an email. I think that's a great way to do is to let people know that you're looking for exciting um, an opportunity for people and spin it like that. Hey, you want an exciting opportunity to give back? Come join us kind of thing. And then contact local organizations uh, like, uh, you know, United Way has chapters, volunteer centers. Um here in our community, we actually have a, um, a, a an organization that that does just that. They they simply match. They're an, they're an all volunteer organization. They get volunteers out on the ground. Um, local universities have um, a lot of access to that as well. Um, there's uh, uh, there's uh, programs that actually will teach people how to be effective board members. Um, a lot of the banks, believe it or not, like the Wells Fargo's and the B of A's and the local community banks, a lot of those folks actually encourage their their employees uh, to um, serve on boards. So kind of keep your ear to the ground on that and, and look at other boards, see who's serving on other boards and and maybe find out if someone's getting ready to cycle out off of a board, maybe start to uh, think about that as well. Um, you know, so the whole idea here is matching people. You're matching people's heart. Uh, uh, with your organization and then again, fill a need uh, with what it is that you need and want on your, um, on your board. Um, so just a few last thoughts on board recruitment. Um, you know, again, have the board engaged and involved in seeking and recruiting. Um, and again, this is just as simply as every once in a while at a board meeting saying, Hey, let's just take a few minutes and talk about are there people um, out in the community that we think we would like to, to have kind of come join our team. And that's an okay agenda item. Um, and this is something I think is really important. Recruitment should be going on year round. In other words, um, if your board, uh, you know, cycle is January through December and you're waiting till November to find new board members, you're risking, um, you know, um, a little, uh, uh, not as smooth of a transition time. Um, and I think you should be talking to people or talking about people in a good way uh, year round um, in your recruitment process. A nominee committee can help with that, but also don't just put it all on that committee. Um, just, con just continue to engage in your board. It's kind of one I've uh, kind of finished this thought on board recruitment with this. Board, rec board recruitment can kind of really feel really time consuming. Uh, but to remember, you're designing the future of the organization. The whole reason why you're recruiting new board members is because your organization wants to succeed down the road. Um, you might be putting someone on your board now that that could really become um, uh, helpful to you two, three, four years down the road for various reasons. Um, it's a challenge for small mall profits. I understand that. Um, but it, it takes to... Um, um, it, it's possible to be intentional, creative, and light-hearted uh, about the process. In other words, you know, you want to have people that are fun. If your if your board meetings are kind of, you know, if you're not enjoying and, and laughing from time to time, I, I'd really encourage you to stop and reevaluate. Um, and you can be a very, you know, have a very serious cause. I mean, you can be in an organization that's dealing with, you know, the the you know, sex trafficking or whatever, very serious issues that you're trying to solve. 
but you as a board want to take some time to kind of be having some fun together about about um, you know getting to know one another and how do we how do we best tackle these problems. Uh, regardless of what strategies you use to identify and cultivate your board members, ultimately you have to get out of the office, meet people, and ask. If you're just googling names. Um, you're probably not going to be as effective as if you're out there, you know, talking with service clubs, rotary clubs, um, churches, um, you know, United Ways, those kinds of things. You know, get out, get yourself out there. And you should be doing that anyways as an executive director. You should be out there interacting with the community. But it's also a great way to get to know folks and get kind of get a lay of the land. And I hope you're um, hope you're already doing that. I see some um, questions coming up, and we, um, Chelsea, thank you, and we'll 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 tackle those here at the end. I'll go back to those, um, but but be thinking of some questions as we as we start coming down to the conclusion in a few minutes. So let's talk about board training a little bit. So we went from burnout, uh, making sure your board's not burned out, to looking for talent, uh, actual recruitment. Now let's talk about board training a little bit. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. But I want to say, first and foremost, you really do need to develop some kind of orientation process. Provide new board members with materials about the organization, a tour of your programs, introductions to board, staff members, um, and a board member expectation form. A lot of boards will provide a kind of just a simple binder, uh, just kind of a welcome binder. And it might be just, um, the, for example, do, do all your board members know your mission statement? Do they know who you are? Do they know, do they know who your staff is? So just maybe you provide them a folder. You don't have to spend a lot of money um, and um, and just give them, you know, your bylaws, um, maybe a roster of the of the board, a roster of your staff, maybe a couple photos or a couple um, examples of things that are going on in the work that you do. And even uh, um, a few months back worth of I don't know if you meet monthly or quarterly or whichever that is. Uh, some of the past minutes and things like that. But but orientating them is really big. Um, the number of, of nonprofits that I have seen and, and or served on as a board member where I go in, I say yes to a board and I start and I've never even been given anything. Um, it's, it's re- it, it feels like it takes a lot to get up to speed. The financials, make sure they understand what the financial statement looks like uh, so they're prepared. So you as, a, you as a leader and your board members are responsible for really making sure that that onboarding process uh, for, the, for new board members is, is done well um, and correctly. Uh, but this is about a lot about board governance. If you're not, if you don't, I'm not familiar with that term, what board governance is, is that's the group of people that are just making sure that you're abiding within um, the laws of your state and the federal laws to be a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, and so that's making sure if your if your bylaws say that you need to meet five times a year, it will sh- it's, it's important that you someone on that on that board keeps it accountable to meet five times a year. Um, so board governance is is um, kind of the um, it's not the prettiest uh, of the jobs in the world, um, but um, it, it's it's super important to to make sure you're kind of minding the store for for lack of a better word. Um, whether if you have formal or informal board uh, settings, you still need guidelines. Some boards are really casual. You know, they get together. Um, if, uh, if you do Robert's rules of order, you know, that can be really intent. That's where you, you know, everybody has to second a motion and do a motion. A lot of bylaws are set up, uh, saying that you need to do the Robert's rules of order or some kind of order. If your bylaws say that you got to make sure you do it. That's what your governance is. If you're a little less formal, that's okay. Uh, but just make sure you still have some guidelines about how the meetings are going to operate. You know, make sure that a financial statement is, is discussed so that so that down the road, if there's ever any, you know, question or issues, you, nobody can go back and say, well, we didn't talk about it or whatever. That's why, you know, I believe all board, whether uh, you're formal or informal, all board meetings should have minutes of some kind, some kind of uh, documentation. And I believe that's legal, um, legally has to be done. Um, but but uh, just be thinking about that. And, and that's in a training issue. Utilize outsourced resources for training and help. I think it's really nice from time to time to have um, outside people come in and, and, and help you with your board, uh, whether that's, um, you know, fundraising help, whether that's um, just motivation. Uh, there's lots of people that that um, that's their passion. That's their expertise is, is working with boards. Uh, maybe your board, you find your board's not getting um, – 
getting along very well or, or having a tough time coming up with um, ideas, new ideas. Those are good times to uh, check in with maybe your regional foundations, check in with, um, you know, find lo local resources. There's tons of resources, I think, out there on the Internet. I'm going to provide you some at the end. Uh, but training is good. And I talked about this before, but I'm going to emphasize it again. I really encourage a retreat, um, a one day minimum where you guys can be locked in a room, whether that's, you know, up the road where there's some, you know, pretty trees or, you know, in a conference room somewhere where you guys can, um, as a board, you know, really kind of roll up your sleeves and ask, okay, how are we doing? What do we need to do differently? And, and where, you know, what's next kind of, kind of thing. So I think that's really important. And then lastly, we're just going to talk about how do we keep uh, uh, our board engaged, retained, and motivated. Uh, re, you know, engaged means, you know, are they are, are they looking forward to your board meetings? Are they looking forward to doing the work they do? Retaining is, are they resigning early? Are they not coming back? And then keeping them motivated. Um, and this is very similar to if you've been on webinars with me before, you know I'm all about the donor cycle. Uh, the donor cycle talks a lot about, you know, identifying and then cultivating relationships. Well, it's the same is true at the board. You want to be, um, you know, identifying good board members. You want to have a relationship with them, and you want to make sure that they stay engaged. So the number one goal to help your board members feel successful about their role, um, about their role and the work uh, they are doing. So that's really one of your main goal is 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 that hey, you want to tell them good job. You want to bring success stories. Uh, to your meetings. Are your board meetings boring? That's what we hear a lot. And so are, are you telling the right stories at your board meetings or are you just doing the business? Are you just, you know, doing minutes and notes? Uh, is your executive director report all technical or are you uh, are you maybe bringing uh, someone to your board meeting who can tell the story? Um, I worked at, at a university here in the area where Aplos is located um, and we often had students come to our board meetings and they would share some of the stories um, about what their scholarships were doing for them um, and the difference it made in their lives. And I think that was um, really, really um, a powerful way use of board meetings. Do a regular evaluation of board roles and responsibilities. That can be a self-evaluation. That can be um, um, uh, an evaluation tool that you pull off the internet and have everyone take. It doesn't have to be like a grade, like you know, everyone feel bad about themselves, but just, you know, kind of just check in with everyone and say, hey, is this working for everybody? And even things like, are the board meetings the right meetings? Are you meeting um, often enough? Are you meeting too often? Are, are, are evenings better than lunchtime or whatever? Um, I think you'll get the, the gist of that. Um, and then are you providing the board with interesting and meaningful work? Are you actually utilizing their skills and talents? In other words, are there some things that maybe you're not inviting them to where they could be invited to? Um, you know, things like uh, sometimes organizations will have a little uh, check presentation um, uh, where where somebody's coming to, to donate money. Well, are board members there to accept that gift or can board members write more thank yous? Uh, we talk a lot about that in um, in one of my previous seminars about having board members um, take every board, take 10 minutes of every board meeting and have them write a thank you note to a donor. That's a great way to engage them um, and 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 tap in, into them. Are your board meetings boring? You know, are your reports um, meaningful? In other words, when I read a report as a board member, am I understanding? how this report reflects the mission of the organization because really all nonprofit, you know, good, good work really comes down to mission. Um, you know, are you, are you doing and communicating the work that you are telling people that you're doing and what you're about? Um, are you sharing success stories about clients lives that you've touched? Um, I think testimonials are a really powerful way and, and maybe you can't bring people to your board meetings, but you can also go out and shoot um, a you know a quick video on your on your uh, iPhone or or, or mobile device. Um, so lots of creative ways on that. So we're going to kind of wrap up a little bit here um, because I like to promise that we'll be done by live, but we will get to some questions. Um, again, are you providing training? Uh, do you have a retreat? These are questions you can ask yourself. 
Um, and are you expressing gratitude? Are board members feeling thanked uh, and, and um, excited about the work they're doing? I did serve on a board a few years ago. And in my three years on that board, I don't think I ever received a thank you of any kind. And I was kind of bummed, to tell you the truth. And it, it was something that I had, um, you know, uh, I really kind of, when I left that board, I sort of told a couple board members, I think they need to work on this. Um, you know, being on a terrific, uh, being a terrific board member is only the first step, taking time to ensure that each board member becomes personally invested and engaged um, in the mission or in the mission and or of the organization. Uh, when the engaged board members, um, they'll become your best ambassadors if they're engaged. So um, we kind of really encourage you to, to kind of think about that as we go. So just some final thoughts, um, and then we're going to do some questions. Thank you for um, those of you who are asking questions, and, and appreciate you guys spending time, spending time out of your busy schedule. Um, hopefully some of this stuff is practical for you. I'd love to hear from you uh, via email or Twitter. Um, if, if it is, and, and also on topics that we can um, do more of. But, but just as you can see here, an engaged board is a forward-thinking board that strives to have a partnership with uh, you as a leader. Uh, um, it's partnering for fundraising, policymaking, uh, engaged boards, work between board meetings. This is really important um, to look at is, is, is how active are, is your board um, you know, between the, the times that you guys meet. Uh, board, good boards are willing to deliberately, uh, you know, be candid, confident uh, on on topics that are maybe sensitive. Um, sometimes, you know what, nonprofits are messy. Uh, there's all, there's um, some great articles about that topic. It's not always cut and dry. Um, this is a little quote from the National Council of Nonprofits. So as bef before we get into questions, you'll see there's some resources there. These are just a really short list. Some folks that I like to go to for my own research um, when um, in particular about um, board training and, and board resources, board source, that's one word. Um, Joan Geary Consulting, she's got a great website. She's got a great um, newsletter that you can get free uh, into your inbox a couple times a week. Um, Nonprofit Hub, uh, Amy Einstein, you can, you can you, uh, write these down or, or take a copy. These are just some quick uh, resources that I think will be available to you. So with that, I want to do some questions and answers. Um, so first of all, we're going to start with um, Chelsea. Who do you recommend where I should? Uh, uh, who do you recommend where I should I look for the board? Uh, can the executive director find the board? Yes, the, exec the executive director certainly can find the board, but the board has to approve uh, who you find. Um, and um, so, so I th again, I think it should be a partnership. If the executive director says, "Hey, I talked to, you know, um, you know, Jones, you know, you know, Joan Smith, and she's interested," I what I would do is I would have a couple people from your board go out and have coffee or meet that person as well, so it feels like it's all three of you. Uh, where do you recommend I should look? Again, uh, looking at some of your community resources, I think service clubs. Rotaries, Kiwanis, uh, those kinds of things are a great place. Those are people that um, um, uh, look and see if you have a volunteer center. Um, reach out to your uh, regional centers or people that um, um, that work with nonprofits would be uh, where I go. Can I skip the board member process until I hire the director? Can I skip the board member process until I hire the director? Um Chelsea, I'm not totally sure I understand that question. If you're a brand new 501c3, um, uh, yeah, so you might have to email per me personally on that one. Uh, this is the first business I've incorporated. I am fearful of the board of directors. I have a uh, very bad experience with the board at the last time I've worked with. Is anyone else nervous? So this is for you all out there. Uh, Ricky Ricky Jones is, is um, had uh, looks like a negative experience with the board. And unfortunately, yes, there's a lot of kind of stories out there of, of people who have had bad experiences. My my recommendation is if you've had a bad experience and you have the opportunity to be on a new nonprofit as a leader, especially, write down the things that, what terrified you about that board. Was it because they micromanaged? 
Was it because, um, you, you know, were they, un, were they, I want to use the word un, uneducated, but that, I don't want to sound that. W did they not know what their roles were? A lot of times board members don't understand their role. So they kind of go into a business mode of, of, well, this is how I handle my business. So I'm going to run this, this nonprofit like a business. And you got to find that fine line. The truth of the matter is, is that, yes, you do have to, you know, have good business practices, but it's not a business. You're not a for-profit. You're a nonprofit, and things work a little differently. So find that kind of fine line. Can you back up one slide? Oh, I'm sorry. Bill, I, I did not see that until just now. Um, I will have this uh, webinar will be available uh, probably within about 24 hours of this. So all these slides will be made available to you guys. What we'll do is we send an email out to, to anyone that registers for their webinar, and we'll um, you'll have the slides. Uh, thanks for sharing. Uh, okay, somebody's leaving. Uh, can you discuss new boards in the fundraising stage? We are working uh, to fundraise enough funds to hire an executive director. Board members are working so hard, and burnout has been a problem. Yeah, um, yeah. So, so it looks like you're a new nonprofit. Uh, so you don't have an executive director yet. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, my, uh, you know, I don't know the exact circumstance here, but I might encourage you. Is, is maybe don't put all the pressure on just your board. In other words, maybe you can find um, uh, start a fundraising committee, get a couple people uh, from the board on that, and maybe try to broaden your scope a little bit um, uh, for the fundraising side of that. Um, you know, the, the, in the fundraising world, if you go back and, and look at any of my past uh, webinars, I talk a lot about. Uh, you know, how are you communicating the need? If the community uh, and, and the people you're trying to fundraise from understand what it is you're trying to do, not we just, oh my gosh, we need money, but, you know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? I think uh, that's a great way to start. But um, I know if the board feels too much pressure, they they, they will start to feel frustrated. Um, and, and Brittany, if, if, if I did not address that, Claire, feel free to email me. Um, I'm, I'm happy to discuss more in detail fundraising practices with anyone uh, by email. Uh, Dan.Kimball at Apolos. I think my slide will come up here at the end. Um, uh, we have a board members that are in different locations and can't afford to have them meet in person. Is Skype okay? Yes, yeah, Skype is okay for board meetings. Um, the, one, the only thing I will say about that is that sometimes we get um, – uh, it has to be in your bylaws, I think, if you have, if you uh, to do an electronic vote. So you just want to kind of clarify that that your bylaws um, allow you to do um, uh, an electronic vote. Um, and I and if it, you don't, it's easy to change. So just kind of FYI on that. But I think uh, Skype is a is a is an okay. The only thing that's hard on Skype is that you just want to make sure that you have a good uh, connection. Uh, maybe uh, make sure you're 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 putting in an environment where that person who's on Skype is. Not looking at like a blank wall, you know. Try to try to figure out a way to engage them if you're doing it in Skype. So, um, I see one ever found. This is kind of for the group. Has anyone ever found a good board member using uh, the want to serve on a nonprofit checkoff on LinkedIn? Um, that's kind of been for the group. Is anybody using LinkedIn? Um, I have not. I'm not saying it doesn't work. I just personally don't have any experience on that. Um, Lots of questions. Great. We are starting this foundation from the ground up. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, new, when you're starting from the ground up, yeah, it's a little different, you know, cause you're, you're trying to kind of, you're trying to find startup people um, and then moving on that. Can you speak about recruiting people from communities that you serve? We help underserved families with parental education support, but usually those folks uh, are overstretched already. We are also particularly interested in recruiting people of color, LGBT, uh, how do you pitch it so as potential board members uh, have realistic expectations? So kind of two questions there. Uh, talked a little bit about is your, um, uh, is your board representative of who you serve? Again, I, the best I can do on that is just say continue to look for success stories. Um, continue to, you know, look for, for um, you know, uh, ethnic diversity I think is huge, especially if that's the population you serve. Ask your board members to, 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 um, to talk with folks. Um, the best thing on realistic expectations is to have just sort of a, you know, a one sheet you can give to the board member. How many times a year do you meet? Uh, you know, uh, what, what, give them a guesstimate of what kind of, uh, what kind of other things will they be doing? Uh, they'll be asked to serve on a committee or they asked to give money. Um, so the more you can communicate, uh, the better. 
what is the direct email? Okay, so my direct email is dan, D-A-N dot Kimball, K-I-M-B-A-L-L at Aplos dot com dan dot kimball at apples dot com or you can uh, reach out to me at twitter at fugitive dmk f-u-g-a-t-i-v-e dmk um i think that's oh boy a few more questions so if you guys want to hang on uh no uh, the, the person that's on linkedin no but the chamber of commerce has a new board member recruiting tool great idea uh, to reach out to your chamber of commerce i think that's a really good idea um Martha, this will I think will be the last question as we're kind of over time. Uh, we are trying to shift our board from a startup working board that does everything, including clean the building, to a traditional board with the people who want uh, and can raise money. Hard to convince the latter to join a board when they see uh, when they still need board members to do a lot of pitching advice. Yeah, my advice on that one, Martha, would be is to maybe have a board that does the business board and then maybe you have an advisory uh, committee and or um, kind of a working committee like, um, uh, you know, a program committee that's volunteers that can do some of that if I'm understanding, right? I think the biggest thing is just if if a small group of people are doing all the work, people are going to burn out. And that's true with any. That's true with donors. That's true with staff. That's true with boards. So the best I can suggest is if your board is 10, um, then find other volunteer opportunities for people that don't have to be board members to help out is, is the best I can do. Um, okay, so I think uh, suggestion for the retreat, this will be the last question uh, when members are not there locally. Oh, gosh, for a retreat. I mean, the best I can do is, is say maybe you do a retreat and you Skype them in for part of it. Um, or you try to find a regional location that I, and I don't know what the distance you're talking about, Deborah. So, uh, maybe you, you, you ask if people can, you know, all drive a couple hours to get to a place that they all can come in. But I would say in this day and age, there's tons of resources, uh, with Skype and those kinds of things, um, uh, for that. So with that, we're going to go ahead and finish up. Uh, just again, um, a little bit about us, uh, Apple software, um, if you're in the need for uh, donor management or um, financial software, you can kind of look us up. And um, just really grateful that you uh, took the time to listen to us. Again, my email is dan.kimball um, at applos. Dan.kimball, K I M B A L L, at applos.com. Feel free to email me privately. Send us out on Twitter. We do webinars once a month. You can look at our Applos Academy off our website. And, um, and good luck to you all in your, in your fundraising efforts. So with that, we'll um, see you guys next month for our next webinar. Have a great day. Mm-hmm.